In a small Gazik we went to inspect the base's facilities. We visited the battery that covered the bay and the newly built land airfield. We were struck by the absence of roads in the conventional sense. The islands of Novaya Zemlya consist mainly of shale and limestone. The glaciers, which in their time dredged the islands, and then incessant winds so polished the surface that sometimes it seemed that under us there was cleanly swept and washed asphalt. True, the asphalt was not distinguished by its smoothness the car ran like on the sidewalk, then suddenly dived into a pothole or steeply scooted up the nose, climbing on a stony ledge. All around was bare not a tree, not a blade of grass, only lichens clinging to the stone. Our man gets used to everything, he can put down roots everywhere. And in this harsh land he also feels himself a master. It was pleasant to talk to the sailors' healthy, cheerful guys. There were no complaints. They all said that they lived well. They were not offended neither by housing nor by food. If only mail and movie pictures were sent more often, then there would be a complete order. And as always, the invariable question, will we soon defeat the fascists we have golden people serving behind the 70th parallel? At Major Sadov's battery we had dinner. The sailors' dinner was tasty and hearty, which pleased the head of the flotilla Ria Gavrikov very much. It was his efforts to deliver here the best products. He also took care that the stock of vitamin preparations made by our medics, under the guidance of the head of the flotilla sanitary service, Colonel of the Medical Service Lubarsky, did not run out. The flotilla medics did a lot to make sure that even in these harsh conditions our people did not know scurvy the worst scourge of the North. In the evening we were taken to the sailors' club and the house of officers. They were built well. Beautifully you will not often meet such buildings on the mainland. We could not bring furniture here, it was made by the sailors themselves. The walls are decorated with paintings by local artists. We have been to an amateur art concert no worse than in Arkhangelsk. You look and listen, and it is hard to believe that all this is happening on the horns of hell, on the northernmost edge of our land. I heartily shook hands with the chief of the political department, Captain Second Rank Spiridon of the Inspirer and leader of all cultural and mass work on the islands. Overcast weather prevented me from visiting the northern tip of Novaya Zemlya Cape Solania. But Jimakin introduced me to a very interesting person, certainly a historical figure, the permanent chairman of the island council, Tycho Vilka. His grandfather moved by boat from the mainland with his family back in the last century and became the first permanent resident of Novaya Zemlya. Then several other Ninets families settled on the islands. Here they provided invaluable assistance to Russian research expeditions. Tycho Vilka grew up on Novaya Zemlya, his children and grandchildren grew up here. Many of them studied on the mainland and then returned to their native land. In 1909-1910, the famous explorer of Novaya Zemlya, geologist V.A. Rusanov, often turned to Vilka for help. Here is how Rusanov spoke about his assistant. He reads the Book of Nature, just as you and I read books and newspapers. He is a living map of Novaya Zemlya. He has a great reserve of mental delicacy. And here we are sitting with Vilka, stocky, broad-faced, high forehead, moustache downward, as oily black as the thick hair on his head. After the defeat of the White Guard in the north, an island council was formed in Belushaya Bay. Tiko Vilka was elected its chairman. Since then he has been the head of Soviet power on Novaya Zemlya. In 1944 he was 60 years old, but he looked younger. Vilka talked slowly, softly. Don't our sailors offend you? I asked. Nobody ever offends me, Vilka smiled. And your men are good. I am friends with them. Vilka smoked a pipe, lingering appetizingly, and recalled many scientific expeditions that had visited these lands. He spoke especially warmly of Rusanov, he was a great man. Loved Novaya Zemlya, he was good. Vilka tells how in Soviet times he led many explorers of Novaya Zemlya along uncharted paths. He proudly showed his gifts, including a navy tunic and a cap with a crab. Then he took out of the trunk a thick book of huge format, bound in the thick hide of some animal. The book was enclosed in a sailcloth bag with a shoulder strap. All the people of Novaya Zemlya are here, the chairman said proudly. Before the revolution there were only a hundred people, now there are more than three hundred. As soon as the weather is good, Vilka harnesses his dogs and drives around all the camps. 
In the first part of his big book, he records births. In the middle notes on marriages, and at the end of the book, the record of the dead. The seal of the island council is kept in a separate pouch. This is how Vilka registered the life of the Nenets on Novaya Zemlya without any clerical apparatus. He was the main counsellor and judge in all their affairs. For active help to the flotilla, I signed with special pleasure the order on rewarding Tico Vilka with medals for military services and for defence of the polar region. We went to bed late and could not sleep, listening to the wild howling of the wind behind the walls of the house. And then the loudspeaker came to life. Attention, attention, says the radio station of the base, walking on the territory to stop. On official business only group passages along the established routes are allowed with the prior permission of the officer on duty. So the Novo Vozomelskaya Bora blew in. Wet snow clung to the windows. In the morning we couldn't open the door until the sailors who came to the rescue shoveled the snowdrift from the porch. We looked out into the air and couldn't believe our eyes. The sun was shining, as if the night storm had never happened. A deafening bird chatter comes from the steep bank. A bird market. Innumerable accumulation of wild geese, ducks, loons, coiras, gulls, clouds swirling over the water, boiling on the rocks. For breakfast we were served scrambled eggs made of carer eggs. By taste these eggs are hard to distinguish from chicken eggs, but they are twice as big. The yolk is slightly brighter in the pan and the white is paler, with a bluish tint. The scrambled eggs are excellent. Eggs and meat of wild birds, fish, found here in abundance, were an essential and very useful addition to the sailors' rations. Golden Arkhangelsk again flew on the Catalina without any special incidents, if not to counter strong turbulence. Life on the flotilla went on as usual. Aviation was flying around the sea in search of submarines and floating mines, Trawlers continuously trawled the fairways. Convoys were going both ways on the Kara Sea. Once during the morning report of the operational situation, it was shortly after our return from Novaya Zemlya Bogolpov, reported. A minesweeper has disappeared in the Dixon area. Neither an airplane nor a specially sent ship found it. What happened to the minesweeper? I ordered to tell to Dixon to the headquarters of the Kara naval base to continue the search. But for several days we learned nothing new. Only at the end of September came a telegram that ships were sent for the crew of the TSH-120. Why for the team? And where is the minesweeper itself? The Kara naval base on Dixon was formed only a few months ago. Perhaps not everything has not yet rubbed off in the management, and the fascists persistently make all sorts of tricks in this area. With a group of officers of the headquarters I fly to Dixon, to understand the incident on the spot. The way is far, more than 2,000 kilometres. Fortunately, the weather was clear in the Arctic, and Catalina flew well. To create a naval base on Dixon was much easier than on the desolate Novaya Zemlya There had long existed a port serving merchant ships and icebreakers, a large settlement of workers of the western sector of Glavs of Morput. Polar explorers warmly welcomed the military sailors and helped them to accommodate. The base commander, Captain First Rank S.V., Kizelov, by nature a calm, unhurried man, a good organiser and an excellent sailor, quickly got along with the old-timers. For the chief of staff of the base, Captain Second Rank P.N. Vasiliev, the sea and ships were also a native element. He had been in these parts many times. Not without reason, he was often entrusted to command convoys. From the heads of the base I heard a dramatic story. Although in war the death of people and ships is almost a fatal inevitability, but differently ships perish, differently people behave in a tragic situation. The behaviour of the crew of the TSH-120 will remain an example for posterity. The minesweeper was going to Dixon as part of the escort of a large convoy, which included four transports with valuable cargo. In the Kara Sea, the convoy was attacked several times by fascist submarines, but all attacks were safely repulsed. On the traverse of Kravkov Island again appeared a submarine and the convoy commander Captain Second Rank PN. Vasiliev ordered TSH-120 to attack it. The trawler headed towards the enemy and soon disappeared in the fog. The convoy continued on its way and the next day came to the port of Dixon. 
and the commander of the TSH-120 Lieutenant Captain D.A. Lysov kept reporting that he continued to search for the enemy boat. Lysov graduated from the Naval School only in 1940, but he was quickly promoted and in 1943 became the commander of a large minesweeper. At the same time he was accepted as a member of the party. He was a brave and skillful commander, already twice awarded battle orders. The sailors loved him. When the convoy reached Dixon, Lysov was ordered to return to the base, but at 10 a.m. he again attacked the boat and rushed to the attack. By this time the weather had turned frosty, snow charges were passing over the sea. In these conditions it was impossible to see neither periscope nor torpedo trace. Besides, as it turned out later, the enemy this time used traceless acoustic electric torpedoes. There was an explosion. The propellers and rudder were torn off. The ship got deformation of the whole hull, the radio station was out of order, the lights went out. The ship lost its course and swayed helplessly with a roll to port. The disciplined, well-trained crew, despite the huge waves, continuously lapping the deck, under the leadership of the commander of the electromechanical part of the ship engineer Captain Lieutenant N.A. Sosnitsky managed to level the roll and stop water access. On a portable radio, the radio operator Komsomolets Porokin persistently transmitted a report to the base. Captain Lieutenant Lysov ordered clearly, businesslike. But he of course realised that the immobile, helpless ship in case of a new enemy attack will be doomed. Therefore, the commander decided to transfer the wounded and most of the crew to the shore, leaving on board only the gunners and the team servicing the bombers. Without any fuss, the officers placed 26 men on a motor sail boat and 20 men on a rescue pontoon. The boat and pontoon were loaded with radios, water anchors and food. The navigator senior lieutenant VA, Dementiev, headed those who went ashore by order of the commander, saying goodbye Lysov handed him his party ticket and orders. Petty officer of the first article, A.K., Doronenko, a businesslike and energetic man, was leading the pontoon. Lysov gave him his overcoat. Take it, it will come in handy to cover the wounded. The commander named the course to go to the shore and ordered to depart from the board immediately. Together with the commander on the minesweeper remained his assistant senior lieutenant, F.A., Demchenko, artilleryman lieutenant K.K., Nakonechny, mechanic N.I., Sosnitsky and 34 other sailors. Hardly had the boat and pontoon moved away from the minesweeper, as everyone saw the periscope, and soon the submarine's deckhouse appeared in the snowy shroud. The minesweeper opened fire. A shell hit the superstructure of the boat, and it hurriedly sank. The sailors on the boat and pontoon saw this, and were very happy with their luck but a few minutes later they heard a huge explosion. Before their eyes the minesweeper broke and went down. Inundated by waves, the boat and pontoon turned to the place of its destruction, but found no one. And suddenly again they saw the Nazi boat surfaced. Fortunately, it soon disappeared in a snow charge and did not notice them. That's how 38 sailors of the TSH-120, led by their commander, died valiantly fulfilling their military duty till the last minute. The endurance with which the young commander of the ship Dmitry Alexeyevich Lysov and his subordinates acted will remain an example for the descendants. Report on the loss of TSH-120 neither on Dixon nor in the headquarters of the flotilla did not receive there was not enough range of small portable radios which were used by sailors. The ship sent to help returned with nothing. Meanwhile, the sailors on a boat and a pontoon made their way through the storm to the shore. Soon they were torn away from each other. In the fog, Dementiev could not find the pontoon, and then the boat engine failed. The navigator Dementiev ordered to raise the sail. Sailors were continuously pumping out water with anything, up to the visor. On the night of September 25th, after 12 hours of sailing, the boat approached a rocky island. Dementiev removed the sail. On oars approached the shore, in the dark landed with sailors. It was a small island Podkova, lost in the Minian Skerries, three dozen kilometres from the mainland. The sailors were met by Zara boys who fished here. They warmed the sailors in their hut, and those who were stronger were taken to the mainland, to Cape V. Kudnoi to the fishing office. From there they reported to Dixon about the arrival of eleven sailors, the rest were still on the island. 
And where are those who were on the pontoon? The raft was bobbing on the wave, it was flooded. The sailors were constantly changing on the two oars. But they could hardly move. Petty officer of the first article AK. Doronenko encouraged the exhausted comrades, assured them that the shore was very close. Seeing that the rowers were completely exhausted, he ordered to build a mast from two oars. They hoisted a sail from tied overcoats. The pontoon went faster, but it could move only in the wind, went not to the south, but to the southwest, lengthening the way. For almost three days the hard voyage continued. September 27th, sailors nailed to the uninhabited islets of Scott Hansen. It was clear that in such bad weather neither airplane nor ship would find them. Doronenko made the right decision he put ashore eight of the most weakened sailors, sheltering them from the wind in the rocks and leaving a supply of food and water, and with the rest went onward. Again the sail of overcoats helped. On October 1st the twelve brave men reached the mainland. Not far away was our battery. From it and reported about a new group of rescued. We immediately sent ships there. On October 6th, the sailors were delivered to the base. Two, who were severely injured in the explosion of the ship, could not be saved. The rest, extremely exhausted and exhausted, were in the care of doctors and soon got back on their feet. I had a long talk with Navigator Dementiev and Petty Officer Doranenko and wrote down their stories in detail. It was a pity that under wartime conditions we were not allowed to publicise information related to the loss of ships. So the name of the valiant commander Lieutenant Captain Dmitry Alexeyevich Lysov and his subordinates remained unknown. I am glad that at least now I can pay tribute to their courage. Having familiarised myself with the affairs of the naval base, I came to the conclusion that it copes with its tasks quite well. Business relations and full mutual understanding established between our sailors and the northern sea route workers, and first of all with AI, Minaev, contributed to the success. And though fascist boats were still prowling in the Arctic, they were unable to influence our sea transportation in any way. And the radio brought more and more cheerful news. Soviet troops are advancing on all fronts. Fighting is already going on outside our homeland. In August, Romania left the war. In early September, Finland laid down its arms. On October 7th, the victorious offensive began on our northern flank. The troops of the Kalilian Front, in cooperation with the Northern Fleet, liberated the entire Pekinga district. The fleet landing seized the ports of Lainakamari, Pechenga and Kirkines. These actions were carried out far away from us were prepared in secrecy, but we guessed about something. Once I received a secret dispatch to send immediately to Polano so many open boats, only I, a member of the military council, and the chief of staff knew about this order. We made sure that even the direct executors did not know anything. Suddenly, the next day, a request came in plain text inform me of the time of dispatch of the boats. A day or two later, the head of the rear of the flotilla receives an order from Polani to check the serviceability of engines on the boats sent, although before that he knew nothing about the ill-fated boats. In the evening, General Gavrikov reported to me, Comrade Commander, everything necessary for the landing will be provided. What landing force are you talking about? I was indignant. Gavrikov took offence. And I did not know that this is a secret, including for me. By the way, today I spoke on the phone with the rear of the fleet. I was ordered together with the boats to send fishing boats and check that the bows and oars were in order. I gave all orders to engineer Captain First Rank Dorofiev and the head of the engineering department engineer Colonel Nikanorov. I couldn't stand it and laughed. So much for military secrecy. And I apologised to the kindly general, explained that I could not do otherwise, and not at all out of distrust of him. A few days later in the morning the chief of the main naval staff, Admiral Alafuzov, informed me. Listen today on the radio order on the occasion of the defeat of the fascist group in Norway. Only I, delighted, hung up the phone V.E. Ananik, V.P., Bogolopov and our scout Captain Second Rank A.N., Sidorov entered the office. By the expression of their faces I realised that they had come with something important. The Chief of Staff silently put a map on the table and pointed with a pencil to the Mezenskaya Bay. Here here sits a fascist airplane and on the radio calls for help. 
Where did it come from? That's what we have to find out, said V.E. Ananik, it is necessary to send a ship there faster. The destroyer on duty went to sea. But at that time our hydrographic ship sent from Yokanji came to the amphibian airplane sitting on the water. It took the airplane in tow, and the crew of five people was transferred on board. The pilots were very young men, frightened to death. The wrong fascist went told later our scout A.N. Sidorov. The destroyer met with a hydrographic ship, took prisoners, Sidorov questioned them. Those willingly told that they flew from Norway to the Barents Sea to communicate with submarines and for ice reconnaissance, but in the darkness and snow charges got lost, fuel ran out and they had to sit on the water and cry for help. The Arctic navigation was coming to an end. It remained to transfer our icebreakers from the Laptev Sea to Arkhangelsk. In December they would be needed here to clear the way for convoys coming from the West. That year the Soviet government received from the United States as a lend-lease order a new powerful icebreaker North Wind, which was coming to us from the Pacific Ocean by the Northern Sea Route. It was accompanied by the flagship of our icebreaker fleet Stalin. We have repeatedly made sure that the Nazis are watching each of our icebreakers, realising the importance of these powerful ships for navigation in the North. We could expect that even now the enemy would try to strike them. The head of the operational department, Captain First Rank NF, Boboslovsky and his deputy, Captain Second Rank BS, Okunev seemed to have calculated every detail. Everyone was worried about the fate of the convoy. I was summoned to Moscow by the People's Commissar of the Navy. I reported him the plan of the campaign. The matter was thought as follows when the icebreakers in the Kara Sea will leave the solid ice, they will be met by eleven escort warships under the command of the Chief of Staff of the flotilla Rear Admiral Bogolfor, who had already left for Dixon. On the passage through the Kara Sea, the convoy will choose deep water, where bottom mines are ineffective, and areas with broken ice, hindering the actions of submarines. At the Karagate Strait the detachment will be met by seven more destroyers, so the escort will number 18 warships. The force is impressive. Good, agreed the Commissar. Keep in mind the leadership of the entire operation is entrusted to you personally. What else is being done for the safety of the convoy? I replied that I will forbid the use of radios. The ships will go at night without lights and will not use any light signals. Only in extreme cases, when a ship needs emergency assistance. This procedure was not our idea. It is recommended in all our tactical textbooks. But unfortunately, it was not always followed. And strangely enough, the first to violate it were some senior officers. The commander of a ship at sea is unlikely to get bored soon and want to contact his superiors by radio. On the contrary, the chief, not receiving long information about the subordinate, begins to worry about his fate and often imperiously demands on the radio to show his place, forgetting that thereby the place of the ship will be open not only to our headquarters, but also to the enemy, is who continuously monitors the airwaves. Having folded the maps, I once again asked the Commissar. So you will allow us to observe complete radio silence? Of course, of course, replied the Admiral. A few days before the approach of icebreakers to the Karagate, I go to Yokanga, where a squadron of destroyers is preparing for the campaign. Together with me arrived here in Aniich and my campaign staff. The flag of the flotilla commander raised on the leader of destroyers Baku. At the appointed hour dropped anchor. The weather forecast was unimportant, expected northwest gale wind and snow charges. Watch ships in the throat of the White Sea, reported repeated contacts with submarines. So our fears are correct, the enemy is just waiting for a chance to attack the icebreakers. We were to meet the convoy at the exit from the Kara Gate. We had no radio communication with it, we knew only the time of its departure from Dixon. Otherwise we had to rely on approximate calculations. The wind was blowing crosswind, the destroyers swayed smoothly, but in general they behaved tolerably well. The sky, as always in the north in November, covered with a gloomy greyish-blue veil. Our speed varied all the time, for sometimes long squalls came on. The flotilla's flag navigator, Captain Second Rank Tesezarevich, did not leave the chart checking his calculations. He was a serious and calm officer. 
He understood that it was impossible to arrive at the rendezvous point neither earlier nor later than the appointed time the convoy should not be left motionless for a minute, otherwise it would become an easy target for enemy submarines. At night I couldn't sleep. I persuaded Rear Admiral V.E., a Nanyuk to go down to the navigator's cabin and take a nap, and he just as insistently recommended the same to me. As a result, we both spent the whole night on the bridge. By the way, the flagship's ability to find time for rest is a great thing, but alas, we often forget about it. The sense of responsibility kills both sleep and all other desires. It's slowly getting light. Binoculars are pointed forward to the east. The high shores of the Karagates are well visible, but not for long in a moment they were hidden by a snow charge. Flag navigator Tsarevich warns me. The icebreakers must be showing now. He wanted to add something more, but he was interrupted by the ringing voice of the signalman. I see the masts and pipes of ships. The Tesadovich smiled broadly, satisfied. His calculations were accurate. The meeting had taken place at the appointed time, at the exit from the strait. Now the whole difficulty lay in the fact that, without slowing down and certainly without stopping, 18 warships as quickly as possible to take their places in the anti-submarine and anti-aircraft order. Old timers of the North Sea assured that for the whole war, it was the first case of joint sailing of such a number of warships. On the mast of Baku, the signal line up in order no. One was raised. The ships begin to move in different directions. The destroyers that arrived with us had to lie on the reverse course and surround the icebreakers with a ring. The minesweepers and big hunters were moving away to the sides and created an outer ring of protection. The regrouping went quickly and well. At the head of the order stood the leader Baku. The ship's commander, Captain Second Rank BP. Bilyeyev ordered the officer of the watch to tell the acousticians to listen carefully to the sea and the signalers to watch the surface of the water. Rear Admiral Bogopov from aboard the icebreaker reported by semaphore that the entire passage was successful, but in the Kara Sea the convoy was attacked ten times by Nazi submarines. Thanks to strong security all attacks were repulsed, and it is very likely that some of the boats received significant damage from our depth bombs. I have long noticed this oddity if, for example, ordered to increase surveillance of submarines, as in a minute someone will report I see a periscope. On inspection it's almost always a mistake, but it gets everyone excited. And so it is now. Barely semaphore from Baku bypassed all the ships. But as one of the minesweepers raised a flag signal I see a submarine, and then semaphore had unreliable contact with a submarine and lowered the signal. This happened more than once. Someone could not stand it and offered to scold the perpetrators of vain alarms, but I objected. It's good that people are alert and vigilant on watch. It was as if the weather was patiently waiting for us to meet, reorganise and start the last stage of the crossing through the Barents Sea. The shores of the strait were slightly out of sight, the wind began to freshen up. More often we had snow charges. Visibility sometimes disappeared at all. When the charge drifted away it was pleasant to be sure that all the ships were in their places. This feeling is experienced by anyone who drives large formations. Signalmen every half an hour measure the wind strength with anemometer. For the umpteenth time they report. The wind is west seven points. Excellent. The always cheerful Beyev responds cheerfully. This is a man who loves hard sea service. In any weather he feels at home on the bridge. Frankly speaking, without Beyev I simply could not imagine the running bridge of the handsome leader. And what, in fact, is great about the fact that it starts to storm, I thought to myself. Bilyev, as if guessing my unspoken question, added, The fresher the wind, the bigger the wave, and the bigger the wave, the harder it will be for an enemy boat to attack us it can be carried by the wave to the surface. Bilyev is right, of course. But what is it like for sailors on big hunters? It is only the name big, but for the harsh barren sea they are such tiny vessels. Already now they are swimming in a solid foam. Before dinner the signalman reported the wind is ten points, and, as if in confirmation, a wave hit the leader's bow with such force that even the bridge shuddered and a downpour of icy bitter salty splashes showered us from head to toe. The usual winter storm was beginning. It was getting dark quickly, but we could still see well how hunters and minesweepers were tossed like splinters, 
how heavy icebreakers were falling from side to side, it seemed that they were already scooping up water with their sides. These ships are built for navigation in ice, and there is no strong rocking there. In the open sea icebreakers also get a lot of trouble. The speed of the squadron had to be reduced to five knots hunting boats and minesweepers can't go faster against such a big wave and storm wind. Soon it became completely dark. I could not see anything, sticky snow was hitting my eyes. The wind howls angrily in the gear and sprays us with cold splashes every minute. My heart is uneasy twenty ships go without lights if any of the little ones. For some reason lags behind, to help him in the darkness will be very difficult. Even to shine a searchlight is impossible. We can only hope for the stamina of our people. At moments it is breathtaking when the narrow and long hull of the leader scuffs the bow. The stream flows noisily along the deck, and then the waves part and we fly into the resulting abyss, hitting the water with a crash. At that moment the foretop is hidden in a humming grey-white mountain. With a roar and a howl this mountain rushes on the guns, on the fighting deckhouse its crest reaches the bridge. The splashes, heavy as pellets, hit the face painfully. At such moments it is better not to look at the sea, however, we can hardly distinguish it in the darkness. With the help of a darkened signal lantern I contact the commanders of the ships. The answers are happy everything is in order. I know that it is hard for everyone now, but I firmly believe people will endure, will do everything that is required of them. Reports about contacts with submarines continue to come in. This is most often reported by hunters. Some of them even dropped a depth bomb. But in such a storm and in such darkness it's unlikely that the boats will be able to attack. It was a difficult night. The commander and I sometimes went down from the bridge to the deckhouse, where there was a radar. On the flickering screen there were two rings of glowing dots. Count them. All twenty of them. But once again I counted the ships seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Where's the twentieth? I'm getting worried. Belyaev mischievously squints at me. Comrade Commander, and you don't take us into account at all. Immediately relieved. Everyone is in place. Well done. Before dawn we were north of Kolgoyev Island. Fascist boats appeared here most often. I ordered to change our general course by 20 degrees to the north. This of course will lengthen our way, but we will try to deceive the enemy. He's waiting for us at Kolgoyev, and we'll pass by. Turning to the north will upset the plans of fascist submariners, they will stay far to the south of our course. And so it turned out no ship had any more contacts with suspicious targets. After turning away we felt a little easier the wave began to hit us not directly in the nose, but more in the left cheekbone. Petty officer communicator brings a radiogram to the commander of the flotilla. Show me your position. Conflot I silently hold out the form to a member of the military council. Ananik reads and shakes his head. I strictly order everyone not to go on the air with any signals, not to give receipts for incoming radiograms. During an hour more than once the coastal radio called us, but we persistently kept silent. In this place it is especially dangerous to give away our presence. In the meantime, all sorts of thoughts popped into my head. What if our bosses really need to know our exact location? But why? What happened? What if it's an enemy provocation? My head is breaking from thoughts, even the storm I stop noticing. But I remember the Commissar's order to maintain radio silence, and I calm down a little. Before entering the throat of the White Sea acousticians again, began to report about the noise of submarine propellers. Just in case we drop a few depth bombs, German submariners are afraid of them. Because of the low speed of movement and deviation from the set course to the north, the convoy arrived at its destination almost a day late, but quite safely. I immediately called the People's Commissar in Moscow. And his first question was, Why did not you respond to the radiogram Comflot? I reminded him. You ordered to maintain radio silence. A short pause, a crackle in the receiver, and again the Commissar's voice. You did the right thing. My heart was relieved. In December convoys on the White Sea followed the icebreakers. Voyage in the fall and winter in the north, and in peacetime is fraught with great difficulties because of frequent fogs, snow charges, ice. And if we take into account that with the beginning of the war the fencing of dangers is removed 
lighthouses and navigation lights are switched off, the difficulties are even greater. And though our operators and hydrographers provided the ships with special wartime logs and equipped the gauges with lights not visible to the eye, the commanders and navigators had to pay maximum attention and skill. At our flotilla hydrography was headed by Captain 1st Rank BN. Pobat, his deputy was Captain 2nd Rank IV. Vasiliev, the oldest fleet hydrographer. They and their staff did a lot of work to ensure safe navigation of ships in any weather conditions. Few people know about the service of hydrographers during the war, their work is sometimes unnoticeable, but extremely important. Thanks to the efforts of specialists of the Northern Hydrographic Expedition under the leadership of Captain First Rank IF. Garkusha, we had all necessary maps with measured fairways, detailed description of even little known bays and islands. Hydrographic ships of the flotilla, commanded by Captain Second Rank NNNN. Bilakshin, during their work, more than once came under enemy fire and suffered losses. Navigation of 1944 was completed successfully. During the year in the operational zone of the flotilla, passed more than 300 convoys, a total of 615 transports, including 142 Allied. Losses did not exceed 0.4%. During this time in our zone, destroyed 10 enemy submarines. The White Sea froze. There were new worries to repair the ships. The head of the technical department of the flotilla engineer captain of the first rank Dorofiev and the flagship mechanic engineer captain of the first rank Lobok Suchenko were knocked down. The factories were overloaded, there were not enough workers, production facilities, materials. I remember with gratitude the help rendered to us by the Arkhangelsk Regional Party Organization. BF, Nikolaev, Nikolaev, the first secretary of the regional committee of the CPSU, was personally involved in the ship repair process and pressed the directors of the enterprises in every possible way. We had the best relations with Sergei Alexandrovich Bogolyubov, whom, as the reader remembers, we met on Ladoga. He was always closely connected with the fleet. Bogolyubov understood our needs perfectly well and solved all questions quickly. It happened that a minesweeper was blown up on a mine, and although it remained afloat, it required serious repairs. I called the director of the plant on the phone. Sergei Alexandrovich, our trawler has been damaged. It must be repaired urgently. I explain what exactly happened. A pause for thought. And then the same answer follows. Let him come. Just give me specialised sailors to manage it quickly. And the question about documentation, money, materials was solved later, when the repair of the ship was in full swing. It is a pity that this good custom is not always observed nowadays. From my bitter experience, I know how difficult it is sometimes to fix the most trivial breakage these days. Telephone conversations rarely help now. You need instructions from above, whole piles of papers. One winter day, when we were fully absorbed in the repair of ships, the adjutant reported that the head of the British mission arrived and asked to receive him urgently. Usually such unscheduled, and even more urgent meetings were connected with some kind of trouble. I was alarmed. But the door opened, and a shining English Commodore appeared in the office, followed by a very young Lieutenant Translator. The Commodore proclaimed triumphantly, O oh, Admiral, I have been commissioned to greet and congratulate you. I have just received a telegram from London our King has honoured you with the highest award of Great Britain the Order of the Bath. For what? For what? For the services of your flotilla in the sinking of the tear pits. The head of the mission firmly squeezed my palm. I was somewhat embarrassed by the unexpected news. Moscow had not yet informed me of this news. And the Commodore happily added that the commander of the Air Forces of the flotilla, General G.G., D. Zuba, and the Chief of Staff of Aviation, Colonel N.K., Luginov, were also awarded English orders. Nothing remained but to thank for the high honours. What was the reason for this awarding of us white sea sailors? By the beginning of the Second World War, the fascists had four powerful line ships, which entered into service in 1936 to 1939. By 1944, three of these giants were already resting on the bottom of the sea. One Tirpitz remained. It was a huge ship displacement, 53,000 tons, 
8 361mm and 12 150mm guns. Battleship since 1943 was based in Norway, in Alton Fjord. Its stay here posed a serious threat to convoys heading from England to our northern ports. Soviet aviation and submarines were constantly watching him. On July 5, 1942, when the battleship tried to go to sea and attack the convoy RQ-17, it was attacked by the North Sea submarine K-21, under the command of Captain 2nd Rank N.A. Lunin. Fearing new attacks, Admiral General Kerr, who commanded the entire operation from shore, did not risk the battleship and ordered it to return to base. Our naval aviation continued to study the system of protection of the battleship from the sea and from the air. All intelligence was reported to the British, who were intensely hunting for Tirpitz. In 1943 they attacked Tirpitz small submarines type Midge, with an underwater displacement of only 30 tonnes. The crew of the mini-submarines consisted of four men. Armament two container charges weighing about two tonnes each. These charges had to be brought under the bottom of the battleship. The six mini-boats were towed by large submarines and headed for Alton Fjord. Two of them died on the way from the storm, the remaining on the night of September 20th, giving up the tugs, began to force the fjord on their own. Soon one of Midge, because of malfunction of mechanisms returned to her tugboat, Another one was discovered by the Germans and sunk by artillery fire from the battleship. Two super-small boats continued the attack. After waiting for the Germans to open the boom to let their boats through, they penetrated the fjord. The boat X-6 under the command of Lieutenant Cameron, after a series of failures, still reached the battleship and put a clockwork charge under its bottom. The crew then sank the boat and surrendered. Submarine X-7, under the command of Lieutenant Pleiss, also completed the task, put the charge, but on the way out was destroyed by an anti-submarine defence ship. The crew was picked up by the Germans from the water. On September 22nd at 8.12am, the charges went off. There was a violent explosion. The battleship took 500 tonnes of water. All three main turbines were damaged. Lights went out. Rudders failed. Hitlerites had to start a thorough repair of the ship. Aviation of the Northern Fleet tried to disrupt the repairs. In February 1944, L-4 planes of the 36th Air Division bombed the Tirpitz. This attack may not have been particularly effective, but it made an encouraging start. In April, when the repair of the battleship is almost over, the British, taking advantage of our intelligence, struck again. Bombers rose from the aircraft carriers Victorious and Furious, and from the other three aircraft carriers took off fighter cover. The attack proved to be a surprise for the Germans. Bombers approached the target from behind the mountains and therefore did not get in the zone of action of enemy radar. They came in two waves diving over the ship. Fifteen bombs of 500 kilograms each hit the target. The ship was damaged thoroughly, more than 200 fascist sailors were killed and more were wounded. But even half-ton bombs could not penetrate the 200mm deck armour, and the battleship could still move, although it required a new large repair. The British repeated several times repeated raids, but did not achieve much, as the Nazis strengthened their air defences. The use of aircraft carriers required too many ships guarding. There was an idea to use heavy four-engine bombers Lancaster, taking off from coastal airfields. But they would not have enough range to return to England. The British government agreed with the Soviet command to base the Lancasters on our airfields. In early September, 41 Lancasters landed near Arkhangelsk. We met the British pilots in a friendly manner, took care of their food, medical care, rest, organised logistical support of the aircraft. This task was entrusted to the Chief of Staff of the Flotilla Air Force, Colonel N.K. Oginov and the head of the political department, Colonel R.I. Aaron Preis, who enjoyed great prestige among the pilots. We must admit that they coped with the task perfectly. Each time before flying on a combat mission, the British consulted with Lodinov on special issues and every time asked the command of the flotilla to convey his warm gratitude. September 15th, six Lancaster flew out for another strike on Tirpitz. Planes carried on board six-ton bombs. Although the Nazis managed to produce smoke battleship, Still five bombs exploded near the ship, and one hit the bow and caused extensive damage. But the battleship still remained afloat. 
the head of the British mission, giving us the details of the air attack, exclaimed. This is some kind of monster, not a ship. Even a six-ton bomb didn't sink it. But we'll surely finish it off. October 22nd, the British repeated the raid on the tour pits from their airfields. Alas, without success. By this time Finland had already left the war, we had taken Petsamo and Liana Hamari. The Soviet army was moving westward toward the Alten Fjord. Fearing that the tar pits could be captured by our troops, the Nazis urgently moved it farther west. Our air reconnaissance found it in the port of Tromso. Hitlerites were going to use the battleship as a floating battery. The ship was put on a shallow place, around erected embankments, so that it did not topple over. Pilots found that the air defence here is much weaker than it was in Alten Fjord. All this data we reported to the British. November 12th battleship attacked 25 Lancaster. Four six-ton bombs fell near the board and two hit the hull of the ship. There was an explosion of ammunition. The artillery turret of the battleship blew up. The entire left side of the ruptured, through the holes rushed water. Tear pits overturned, broke apart and sank, burying in its depths 1,200 people of the crew. Thus ended the Nazi line fleet. The British were very happy about this victory. British Prime Minister W. Churchill on the same day sent a telegram to the head of our government in which he reported bombers of the Royal Air Force sank the Tirpitz. Let us rejoice in this together. A hearty congratulation from Moscow followed in reply. In those days the English greatly appreciated our help. Unfortunately, now English historians persistently omit such facts of the joint struggle of our peoples against the common enemy. The year 1944 was marked by the complete defeat of fascist troops in the Arctic Circle. Hitlerites have lost bases of the fleet in northern Norway. However, they still had a few dozen submarines, which still tried to attack our convoys. Therefore, we still had to spend a lot of effort to protect maritime transportation. May 9, 1945, I was in the brigade of ships at the veteran of the submarine fleet Rear Admiral P. N. Vasunin. We reviewed current issues. At dawn I was awakened by Vasunin. Get up quickly, read the telegram. I snatched the sheet from his hands. It was a message about the surrender of Hitler's Germany. We kissed firmly, congratulating each other. At that time, from the river came the loud intermittent honking of the transports of the last Allied convoy. Victory, victory seemed to be sung by the sirens. Rallies and meetings began. Sailors fervently expressed their joy, pride for our motherland, gratitude to the Communist Party, which managed to raise and inspire the whole nation to defeat fascism, the bitter enemy of mankind. But the war at sea did not end. Fascist boats were still snooping on our communications. Every convoy had to be closely guarded. Soon I was again transferred to Moscow to the post of Deputy Chief of the Main Naval Staff. In August 1951, I was informed that I was appointed commander of the Pacific Fleet. I considered it, of course, for a great honour. Even then it was our largest and most promising fleet. At dawn I left for Vladivostok by special airplane. It seemed somehow chilly and lonely in a big car not filled with passengers. Almost all the way, especially behind the Urals, it was chattering. After the main naval staff I was in charge of the Naval Academy named after KEE. Voroshilov for several years. It was a pity to part with a wonderful team of scientists and teachers. The Academy was mastering the experience of fleets in the war. Special attention was paid to the methodology of practical training. I have a vivid memory of the head of the Department of General Tactics, Professor Rear Admiral N.B. Pavlovich, a man in all respects remarkable. From boats and minesweepers he created a special training flotilla, and it practically solved many tactical problems directly at sea. The ships were commanded by students of the academy. These practical exercises were universally popular and were very useful. I warmly remember my co-workers, friends, and the thought does not leave my head what awaits tomorrow. A young lieutenant after graduation will never tell his girlfriend that he is going to the Far East. He is sure to say proudly, I'm going to the Pacific Ocean. The ocean amazes with its majesty, the mighty crash of waves. Let's face it, at the first stages of service the lieutenant will drink bitter kvass there, 
but in a couple of years he will become a real sailor, strong-willed, physically hardened, and will love his restless profession even more. I remember in my gymnasium days in textbooks, and on all geographical maps it was written the Great, or Pacific Ocean. Nowadays, for some reason it is called only the Pacific Ocean, although it is great in the full sense of the word it occupies almost half of the entire area of the world ocean, and its depth reaches 11,000 metres. But about the Pacific Ocean you can argue. It is the famous navigator Magellan in 1,521st crossed it in clear, quiet weather and gave it such a name. But Magellan was just lucky. My first date with the ocean was quite different. We were sailing to Kamchatka, and our destroyer was crumpling and tumbling as if it had fallen into the jaws of an enraged giant beast. The steel hull was cracking and groaning it was about to fall apart. Even experienced sailors felt unwell, and like children, rejoiced when the Kamchatka shore appeared. Here on the Pacific Ocean is the birthplace of typhoons. From here they rush with furious force for thousands of miles, often swallowing on their way not only transports, fishing signers, but also modern warships. However, despite its violent temper, Russian people have always been drawn to the ocean, and we have every reason to consider it what is called our own. Back in 1639, Ivan Moskvitin laid the foundation of Russian Pacific navigation. Later, in 1648, Semyon Dezhnev discovered the strait between Asia and America, but his petition disappeared without a trace. This area was again surveyed and described by the captain commander of the Russian Navy VI, bearing in 1741. The strait is named after him. And can we forget Lieutenant Commander Nevelsky, who proved in 1848 that Sakhalin is an island, not a peninsula, as foreigners claimed. Hardly any other ocean or sea that washes our shores has seen so many geographical discoveries. The Pacific Ocean has long been considered the best school for Russian sailors. Here began their glorious way future famous naval leaders D.N., Senyavin, P.S., Nakimov, S.O., Makarov. The School of the Pacific Ocean gave the Soviet fleet the most talented admirals, such as S.G., Gorshkov, N.G., Kuznetsov, I.S. Yumashev, V.A., Kasatonov, N.N., Amelko. Nature itself fosters here a constant readiness and will to fight. The ocean is conquered by the brave and strong. Countless roads he opens before courageous people. The ocean separates us from America by thousands of miles, but these miles connect us with it, as well as with many other countries. Japan is very near here. Many times we have been threatened from there, from the Japanese islands. It took a lot of effort from our people to defend the native Russian Far Eastern lands from the samurai invaders. We have a good memory, and we have not forgotten anything. But we do not hold a grudge. We sincerely wish one thing to live in peace and friendship with all our neighbours, including the hard-working Japanese people, and we hope that no dark forces will be able to break this growing friendship. Dot, 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 our Lee too crossed rain and storm fronts several times, often landing for refueling. And only on the fourth day we landed safely in Vladivostok. And immediately I found myself in the circle of old friends, admirals and generals familiar from the war and even from the pre-war service. We served with the chief of the fleet staff VA, Kasatonov in the Baltic and then in the main naval staff. He is a highly educated, experienced operator and an excellent organiser. His reception room is never crowded with officers waiting for their turn to report. This detail always testifies to the organisation and clarity of the work of a chief of any rank, as a result of his many years of fruitful activity, VA. Kasatonov later became an admiral of the fleet. He successfully led the first long-distance campaigns on nuclear-powered submarines, for which he was awarded the title Hero of the Soviet Union. We also met with the head of the political department, Yakov Gurievich Pochupailo, as longtime friends. We knew each other from the Black Sea, he was the commissar of the cruiser Chervona Ukraina, and I was the commander of the submarine brigade. Pochupailo was universally respected in the fleet, although he was quite strict and demanding. He was famous for his ability to effectively and purposefully build party political work. Today, yeah, gee, Pochupailo deservedly wears the epaulets of a full admiral member of the military council Gavriel Fedorovich Zaitsev I, like Kasatonov, knew well in the Baltic, in the most difficult, initial period of the war. 
Steady, self-sacrificing, he was an example of a true communist. The length of the Pacific theatre more than 5,000 kilometres. It is natural and logical that there is a need for a large and strong fleet. We had compounds of surface ships and submarines, air force, powerful coastal defence. Every year the fleet received the latest ships, submarines and airplanes. They required new bases and airfields, and for people housing. My deputy for construction and cantonment of troops, Major General of Technical Service AK. Dubinin was in charge of a wide front of works. He was assisted by engineer colonels Tashav, Afanasenko and Medvedev. The commander of the coastal defence, Major General G.G. Kudrivsev, who had once fought heroically in the Baltic, was constantly engaged in construction. The construction plans were huge. Some construction sites were on islands, in the mountains, in distant, almost uninhabited places. I had to immediately get involved in this business to solve the issues of delivery of people, materials and equipment to the place of work. The army of builders had to be continuously supplied with everything necessary. Despite all the difficulties, we coped with the construction plans. Much depended on the workers of the rear of the fleet. They were headed by Rear Admiral N.I. Nikitin, an excellent economist and an experienced sailor. The military council of the fleet was constantly interested in the work of the rear. Neither highways nor railroads along the coastline was not there yet, and all the supply went only by sea. Unfortunately, our auxiliary fleet in its growth lagged behind the rapidly developing combat corps of the fleet. This was our weak point, or as is often, but not always fairly said, the disease of growth. Some put the question this way, what is more important to build a tanker or a submarine? This is scholastic talk. In fact, the power of the fleet consists of the totality of all interacting elements, which means that both submarines and tankers are equally necessary. Otherwise, a flux to one side is formed in our fighting organism. We were convinced of this more than once during the war years. Today, our auxiliary fleet has grown immeasurably. It is able to provide our ships at any point of the world ocean. Visiting ships. I never missed a chance to visit auxiliary ships, trying to emphasize respect to the humble workers of the fleet rear. One day the tanker Polanik, returning from Kamchatka, entered the bay where we were standing with a group of ships of Captain First Rank MNN. Osipov. I went to familiarize myself with the ship and its people. Having entered the deck, I ordered to raise the flag of the fleet commander. To everyone's embarrassment, there was no such flag on the tanker. It was thought to be required only on warships. My aide-de-camp, a prompt midshipman A. Karachushin, who during the war sailed a lot on auxiliary ships, thoughtfully took the flag of the fleet commander and handed it to the commander of the ship. The flag was hoisted and the inspection began. The ship was in exemplary condition and the very fact that the flag of the fleet commander was hoisted on the tanker quickly became known on all ships and was perceived as a well-deserved tribute to the work of humble toilers of the sea. From that day on whatever military transport or tanker I visited, everywhere the flag was in place and immediately hoisted on the mast. Combat training in the fleet was well put my predecessor, Admiral N.G. Kuznetsov. As they say, I arrived ready to go, it remained to get into work and move things forward. I tried to go to sea more often to check the ships and people in action. Once went out on the cruiser Kalinin to watch the firing of the main caliber. The cruiser was commanded by Captain First Rank A.G. Aistov, a tall, representative officer of middle years. He masterfully managed the ship. I noticed that he knew almost every sailor by sight. The sailors spoke of their commander with great respect. To match him was an XOBV Kazeni at the firing cruiser received an excellent mark. In those days, in the still hot traces of the war, sailors of all ranks were engaged in the study of combat experience. The importance of this task was pointed out to me back in Moscow, and immediately after my arrival at the fleet I started to do it. The main thing was to develop in every possible way the initiative of commanders of all ranks to cultivate determination and perseverance in achieving the goal. Combat training plans were drawn up carefully, in accordance with our technical capabilities, although they were not comparable with those of today. At that time we did not have nuclear submarines yet, we sailed on diesel torpedo boats, which could not stay in the underwater position for as long as it is possible now. 
Not all surface ships had good anti-aircraft artillery, and our fighter aviation could not cover them further than a hundred miles from the coast. We realised the inevitability of change. While theoretically at games, sailors began to master the new tactics. The revolution in technology and weaponry was already pushing its way through. But no matter how advanced the technology, the decisive role remained with man. It was necessary to develop the most important qualities of tomorrow's sailor and above all the commander the organiser of the battle. The fleet of those days played its role in training many thousands of sailors and officers for the future missile and nuclear fleet. We sailed then a lot and for a long time. Throughout the year we repeatedly held gatherings of the entire fleet to solve tactical problems. At the same time we were away from our bases for a month or even more. There is hardly any sense to tell in detail about the exercises which have long gone into the realm of history. I will allow myself to recall something, perhaps of minor importance, but instructive even nowadays. Each area of the maritime theatre has its own peculiarities. No lotions will help in studying these peculiarities, and it is very important to know them. I made it a rule to persistently ask fishermen, local old-timers, fleet veterans about all signs of weather changes in this or that area. And it came in handy more than once. Once we gathered the fleet for a large exercise, head of the marching staff, Rear Admiral E.P., Zbritsky in the evening reported to me the plan for the next day. It was planned, in particular, practical torpedo-firing submarines. Training torpedoes, having passed under the keel of the target ship, usually automatically surface, and they are lifted out of the water torpedo boats. But in the wind among the waves to find a surface torpedo is not so easy, and to lift it on board in a strong rocking, and not to damage even more difficult. Naturally, I asked E.P., Zbritsky, what kind of weather the weather forecasters were promising? Zbritsky is an experienced sailor. In the past, he commanded a destroyer, cruiser, skillfully fought in the Baltic, sank more than one enemy ship. We have long been acquainted with him, and I fully trusted his competence. Not by chance, he was often appointed chief of our marching staff. This time, Zbritsky refrained from answering. Let me call the weather forecaster. Let's hear his report. A young major appeared and very detailed, with a map in his hands highlighted the meteorological situation in the theatre. I asked. Well, what kind of weather will be tomorrow in the area of torpedo firing? The forecaster cut off without a hesitation. The weather will be good, comrade commander. The conversation took place on the bridge of the cruiser. I looked at the coastal mountain. Local fishermen told me a lot about it. According to their observations, if in the evening the dome-shaped top is hidden in the grey clouds floating in the valley, it is a sure sign of worsening weather. Now the mountain is just in thick grey clouds. And it seems to me, comrade major, that the weather will be bad, I said. The forecaster shrugged his shoulders with resentment, collected the maps and, asking for permission, left. Then he poured out his soul to Zbritsky. What grounds does the new commander have not to believe the strictly substantiated scientific conclusions of the synoptic service? Zbritsky smiled and replied, Let's wait, comrade major, the morning is wiser in the evening. And in the morning a fierce zuid ost blew, a big wave rose, everything was covered with fog. Torpedo firing had to be postponed. It is worth regretting that such quite reliable local signs of weather for some reason are not given in the logs of the seas. We paid a lot of attention to the combat training of submariners. I was at all their major exercises, more than once went to sea with them. One of our small boats practiced swimming in the underwater position. The commander and the mechanical engineer were young, and I wanted to get to know them better. I was not in the habit of warning about my arrival, and I was not followed by a retinue of accompanying staff specialists. And this time I took with me only the flagship navigator Captain First Rank Yurosevich experienced and familiar with our theatre. The boat was at the roadstead. I got off the boat. I had no time to say hello to the crew and go around the ship, as I heard the noise of the engine. Having noticed the flag of the fleet commander on the little one, the commander of the connection rear Admiral E.G. Shulakov, and the flagship mechanic immediately rushed to the boat. 
We took off the anchor, running briskly under the diesel engines on the quiet surface of the bay. Standing at anchor ships play call a welcome signal to the fleet commander, on which the teams of ships take the position of stand still, on the faces of submariners joy, for once the little one is the first to be greeted by all, even the largest ships of the fleet. In the area of the exercise came very quickly, stopped the diesel engines, switched to electric motors. The boat was immediately quiet. Sailors worked quickly, clearly, diligently, on the faces shining smiles. I understand the flag of the fleet commander flies on the little one, not every day, and the guys do not want to hit the dirt face. The honour of the ship. The guests are cramped in the central post. The figures of the chiefs are heavy, obviously not according to the size of the little one. We try to squeeze in between valves and instruments, so as not to disturb the crew. Shulakov, tall, dense, having bumped his head more than once, sighs. Yes, this is not the Leninets water rumbled in the ballast tanks. We begin to dive. The commander of the ship, a red-haired lieutenant captain, is visibly worried. The mechanic, on the contrary, is calm. He is confident in his calculations. Boson, maintain a depth of 20 metres. I, hold 20 metres. I look at the arrow of the depth gauge. Behind my back is Shulokov. I can hear his breathing. He, apparently, also does not take his eyes off the device. The boson reports. Depth of 20 metres. And then adds in a trembling voice the boat is heavy. The depth is 30 metres. The commander increases the speed. The electric motors hummed harder. But the boat continues to sink. Threateningly increasing trim on the bow. The commander stops the electric motors. And the boat continues to fall. Finally, the bow hits the ground. We're piled on top of each other. Several electric lights go out. The boson, worried, reported. The depth of 60 metres. Sweat streams down the commander's cheeks. He commands. Look around in the compartments. Judging by the reports, everything is in order. Rudders and propellers are intact. No leaks. Shulakov called the mechanic and demanded to show the calculations of the trim of the ship. I went to the navigator's table and looked at the map. Not far from us there were large depths. If we hit the ground there, the boat could be crushed by the water pressure. Chulikov, a calm, gentle man, lost his temper this time. His bees filled the entire cramped compartment. He finished his rant with a short phrase. I'm ashamed of you. It was lunchtime. I allowed to have lunch on the ground and it was part of the drill plan. What did we have? I also asked the mechanical engineer to show the calculations. I look, everything seems to be correct. I ask, where did you do the trim? On the roadstead. Before we arrived? Yes. So that's what's wrong. The mechanic didn't take into account the weight of the guests. The four of us will weigh about 300 pounds, that's a lot of weight for such a small ship. So having taken on ballast, it began to sink faster than usual. Of course, all this could have been quickly corrected, but the excitement affected, the young commander hesitated. Having detained the commander, his assistant and mechanical engineer, Shulikov and I analysed their actions in detail and pointed out their mistakes. The young officers were discouraged by what had happened. I encouraged them as much as I could, after lunch we surfaced started again, and the training went well. However, the tank bulletin quickly spread throughout the connection the story about how two admirals with their complexion almost sank the boat. In the fifties the situation in the navy was quite turbulent. Foreign airplanes repeatedly invaded our airspace. The Soviet people learned about it from brief reports that fit into five or six newspaper lines. They were quickly read and forgotten, and these events spilled a lot of blood for us. When unknown airplanes invade the airspace of the motherland, it is always alarming why and what are they flying with. In any case, we must force the intruder to land at our airfield. This is a difficult and delicate matter. We understood it very well and sympathised with our pilots. In order to develop initiative in commanders, the ability to quickly orient themselves in the situation, to make bold decisions, it is useful to more often set them unexpected tasks, 
Every time when a member of the military council and I, going by ship to Kamchatka, approached a base on the way, its commander received a short radiogram without any warning find and attacked the enemy. By enemy, of course, meant our ship. Having received such a task, the base commander had to immediately take measures to detect and attack the enemy with all available forces. There was no time to make paper plans, to hold meetings, various clarifications. After all, the real enemy would not wait for the base to prepare for a repulse. Commanders had to act quickly and decisively, as in war. At first, not everything was smooth, but in the end we achieved our goal we were found and attacked before we opened fire. The commanders of the formations liked such exercises. Officers were given an opportunity to prove themselves. They decided everything themselves, without any tutelage from above. In my opinion, it was a good school. The experience of the war teaches that the Navy cannot succeed without close cooperation with ground forces. The troops of the Primorsky military district was commanded by a remarkable military commander, Colonel General Sergei Biryuzov, a man of great will and inexhaustible energy. I liked his manner of giving orders short, clear, without raising his voice, but in a tone that allowed no objections. General Biryuzov created in his headquarters and in the headquarters of his armies an atmosphere of respect for the Navy, and therefore the business interaction between ground troops with sailors was strong and constant. The troops of the Khabarovsk military district, our neighbour to the north, was commanded by Colonel General Nikolai Ivanovich Krylov, and with him we established excellent relations. Krylov knew the fleet well, together with the sailors fought in Odessa, and then in the Crimea. Calm, poised, strict and fair, he was universally respected in the army and navy. And over all of us, the commanders of districts, and the fleet, in the full sense of the word, was the head of the Far East Troops Marshal of the Soviet Union Rodion Yakovlevich Malinovsky. In the past, a private in the Tsarist army, who was in the First World War in the Russian Expeditionary Corps in France, Rodion Yakovlevich, knew the soldier's service, well, all its hardships experienced, and therefore was close to the soldiers and sailors. They always listened to him with the deepest attention. In the last years of his life he liked to create the appearance that he was stern and very strict, but in reality he was rarely kind and sympathetic. Rodion Yakovlevich believed in people and fatherly attitude to young people. If he once noticed a worthy person, made a positive opinion of him, he defended him regardless of any opportunistic considerations. True, he rarely lavished praise on generals and admirals, but with a special pleasure at exercises awarded soldiers, sailors and young officers. We conducted many joint army and navy exercises, almost always in the presence of Marshal Malinovsky. I remember once the landing ships of the fleet, at exactly 6am, had to land a tactical landing with a rifle regiment. In about 30 minutes to the landing site arrived Malinovsky and Biryuzov. Where is the paratroopers? asked the commander-in-chief. I reported that the landing on the ships made at exactly the appointed time and now landing ships are on the passage by sea. Marshal squinted his eyes and winked at Biryuzov. And how do you know all this, comrade admiral? I pointed to the tent under the rock, where there was a camp radio station. I maintain constant radio contact with the commander of the landing party. What time is the landing party? 600 sharp, as you ordered. And immediately I instructed the operator of the campaign headquarters, Captain Second Rank G.I. Ginkel to once again tell the commander of the landing party, Captain Second Rank Shekatov, that the landing should begin exactly on time. Dot 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 the morning was cold, rain was pouring down, we all froze, standing on the low bank by the cold water. No ships in sight. Time drags very slowly on such occasions. Marshal looks at his watch, then at me, as if something is written on my face, and says to his companions, It's seven minutes to six, and there's no landing party in sight. Apparently the fleet can not exactly on time to carry out the landing. Let's go, comrades, warm ourselves in the tent. Malinovsky, and after him and all the others rustled their boots on the coarse pebbles, climbing up the hill to the large headquarters tent. I stayed where I was, in a bad mood. Ginkel, noticing this deliberately loudly, so that everyone could hear, reported. Comrade Admiral. 
The landing will be exactly at six o'clock, as ordered. Malinovsky turned, frowned angrily, wanted to say something, but at that time we heard the rumble of diesel engines. The ships were hidden from us by a huge rock, enclosing the bay from the north. At last landing ships began to jump out from behind it one, another, another, another. They were walking in a keel column, then turned around in a front line and ran to the shore. Well done, Shikatov, I wanted to shout. The first ramp opened almost at the feet of Marshal Malinovsky, and on it carefully rolled out a tank. Comrade Marshal, I address the commander-in-chief, allow me to check my watch. I have exactly six. Malinovsky pretended not to hear. From some ships with noise and clanking crawled tanks, from other ran out of the soldiers. Colonel General Biryazov came up to me and quietly in my ear whispered, Admiral, one zero in favour of the fleet. The exercise went well, and the commander-in-chief after the review awarded valuable gifts to the commander of the detachment and all commanders of landing ships, encouraged also many soldiers and sailors. The scope of the exercise was expanding. Later, in a large joint exercise, we landed already a rifle division with floating tanks. Lieutenant General Priobrzezinski commanded the landing, and Rear Admiral Zbritsky commanded the landing. The exercise was attended by Minister of the Navy N.G. Kuznetsov, representatives of parts of the district, guests from China, Korea and Mongolia, Commander-in-Chief Malinovsky, and this time meticulously monitored that exactly kept to the timing of strikes. After all, in battle, the time factor is always crucial. And this exercise was a success. Especially well-acted naval pilots, the new commander of the fleet aviation, Lieutenant General N.S. Jitinsky, for the excellent organization of airstrikes, earned the praise of the commander-in-chief. And perhaps this case was one of the reasons that two years later, General N.S. Jitinsky became head of the Department of Aviation Tactics of the Naval Academy. Once R.Y., Malinovsky decided to watch the firing of the cruiser main caliber. On the cruiser Kalinin with the marshal arrived Colonel General S.S. Biryuzov and the Chief of Artillery District Lieutenant General V.I. Kazakov. The weather was quiet, the sun was shining, visibility was excellent. We went out to sea, developed full speed. Presence of high command on board always excites sailors. The commander of the cruiser captain, first rank Astov, stood in the combat deckhouse focused, silent. The head of the political department of the unit, Captain First Rank A.I. Noskov and the political officer of the ship, Captain Second Rank N.N.N. Shirovko went from turret to turret, talked to the gunners, encouraged them before the upcoming exam. They were strong political workers, able to find the way to the sailor's heart. The enemy appeared on the horizon a sea tugboat with a large ship's shield. We sounded the battle alarm. And you will not fire at the tugboat asks Marshal. General Kazakov explains that the towing end is long enough and there can't be such an endurance on the target. I think that the Marshal himself understood it perfectly well, but could not deny himself the pleasure to tease the sailors in a friendly way. We lay on a fighting tack, and the command was given to open fire. The ship shuddered. In the face hits a wave of hot air, although we are standing on the top bridge, far from the guns. The generals are watching the firing with binoculars. Underflight. More underflight. Overflight. The ship's senior artilleryman, Captain Third Rank G.A. Pavlov stops firing to make the necessary corrections. Taking advantage of this pause, R.Y., Malinovsky quietly, but so that everyone could hear on the bridge, says. From the tugboat, it is true, the shells fell far away, but not close to the shield either. The last words were drowned out by the thunderous salvo of all the guns of the main calibre. This time the splashes from the fall of shells completely covered the shield. General Biryazov enthusiastically exclaimed, Great. The firing was short. We sounded the alarm and slowed down. We received a message from the tugboat, six direct hits. I report to the marshal. He smiles slyly and asks, Are we allowed to see the shield? Of course, I answer, we always inspect the shield after firing. I order the commander to increase the stroke. 
not far from the shield cruiser slowed down, and all saw in the huge cloth's four gaping holes. Two more blackened at the base of the shield. The firing received an excellent mark. On arrival in Vladivostok, Malinovsky thanked the commander, and artillerymen, unsatisfied, left the ship. Excellent cruiser firing was the result of painstaking and persistent study, which was led by the flagship artilleryman Captain 2nd Rank VD. Smenov, a very thoughtful and educated officer. As well as Kalinin fired cruiser Petra Pavlovsk, which was commanded by an excellent sailor, a great organiser of ship service, collected, taught Captain 1st Rank F.I. Ismailov, I love to sail on this ship, which always shone with cleanliness and order. This was no small merit of the senior assistant to the commander, Captain 2nd Rank M.L. Kandakov. If the commander of the cruiser was strict and looked solid, the small, round M.L. Kandakov lively, cheerful, mobile reminded me of the classic type of senior officer, masterfully written out by Stenyukovich. In his stories, a senior officer runs around the ship from morning till night, making it clean and tidy. Such were our Ixas captains two rank ML. Kandakov on the Petropavlovskan BV, Kazeni on the Kalinin. They were the soul of discipline and order on the ship, tireless advocates of high maritime culture. It is no coincidence that both soon became commanders of these very cruisers, captains of the first rank. Fleet commanders called the Minister of Defence G.K. Zhukov. He wanted to know our opinion on further construction of the fleet, as well as strengthening military discipline. At this meeting I decided to share my thoughts on discipline in connection with the just-ended campaign of several of our ships in a foreign port. We always pay a lot of attention to strengthening military discipline. It is understandable what kind of army and navy can there be without strict military order, but discipline is often judged on purely formal grounds. Different chiefs have their own criteria in this matter, and often these assessments are biased someone from above said that discipline in this unit is bad, and the inspector, without giving himself the trouble to deeply analyse the situation, juggling only with figures, gives a harsh verdict. And the label of indiscipline sticks for a long time, it is unlikely that one or another ship going abroad at that time could receive an impeccable assessment of the state of discipline on formal grounds. There were sailors on the ships who had committed misdemeanours in the past, and they fulfilled the government task in an exemplary manner. Is this not the best confirmation of the fact that you cannot judge about discipline only by formal signs relying on numbers? Our sailors and officers were brought up by the party. They are fiery patriots of the motherland. We trusted them, and we were not mistaken. In general, Yakov Gorevich Pochupailo, a member of the military council, and I sought to delve deeper into disciplinary practice. A former sailor himself, who knew the Navy life well, Pochupailo believed that first of all it was necessary to understand the soul of a man. We are dealing with young people, and youth is inherent to make mistakes. A sailor sometimes commits a misdemeanor simply because of ignorance, because of a misunderstanding. But when a misdemeanor is committed, the Charter requires to impose a penalty on the guilty party. The Charter for us is an iron law, but in all cases of life it must be supported by serious educational work, and we have developed a kind of report card of penalties for such a misdemeanour as this, and that, and for another that. We have seen that such standardisation is of little use. A quick punishment, as if by the tax, does not always affect the sailor's sailor's psyche, does not affect his consciousness. They say that I have done something wrong. I will bear the punishment myself, and it is nobody's business. A man does not realise that he is letting down his commander's comrades, reducing the combat effectiveness of the ship. As a result, it happens that a sailor even gets used to misdemeanours he did something, got so many days without shore, and the matter is over. We came to the conclusion that before imposing a penalty, it is necessary to study the reasons that gave rise to this or that misdemeanour, to be able to touch the conscience of a man, to make him listen to the opinion of his comrades. Then the punishment, even if not so severe, will have a stronger effect and will have a greater educational value. We demanded from petty officers and officers to constantly analyse the disciplinary practice and continuous improvement of all educational work. The minister listened attentively to our considerations and agreed with them. In the Navy continued to live a busy, and always hectic life combat training, 
ship cruises, construction. And the main thing, constant vigilance, protection of the sky and our sea borders. We worked in full contact with the regional party committee and local party organisations, at every step feeling their help, especially in construction, in the welfare of sailors. Our fleet was growing day by day. Today the Red Banner Pacific Fleet is a reliable outpost of the Soviet country in the Pacific Ocean. In 1956, I received a new appointment. I became head of the Naval Academy of Shipbuilding and Armament, named armed after I.N. Krylov. Passing through Moscow, I went to the Minister of Defence Marshal of the Soviet Union, G.K. Zhukov. Without any preamble, he immediately got down to business. Now we are building a fleet quite different, based on the achievements of Soviet science and economy. I think it is clear to you that qualitatively new weapons need an advanced military theory. Without it, all our efforts will come to naught. The academy, which you are to command, must set the tone in the field of theory, in the development of new forms of naval art. I hope you understand it's a great honour to command such an academy. With the minister's admonition I went to Leningrad. The academy reflected the diverse life of the navy. Faculties and departments of all specialties, hundreds of students, qualified, authoritative teachers, most of the honoured veterans of the fleet, famous in battles. Our military science was then experiencing a sharp turning point caused by the military technical revolution. There were new problems of using atomic energy, missiles, computer technology. The rights of citizenship persistently won a young science cybernetics. Against this background, the contours of strategic tasks to be solved by the fleet, which went out into the wide ocean expanses, which we had never dreamed of before, being tied to the coastal areas of maritime theatres. The new tactics and operational art persistently broke its way. The Navy put forward new and new tasks before the scientists, so for decades anti-submarine defence was reduced to the direct protection of ships from submarine attacks. Now our fleet had the opportunity not only to defend, but to strike the underwater enemy destructive blows before he tries to use their weapons. The same applies to the fight against the aggressor's surface ships. We could now strike a decisive blow without waiting for the enemy to approach our shores. To create a coherent and vitally correct theory that helps in solving combat problems that's what was required of the team of scientists who developed the problems of naval art. And the first word belonged to young talented scientists able to quickly perceive the latest scientific ideas and equip them to the command staff of the fleet. But the role of old, proven personnel was not diminished. Many officers, with whom I once sailed and fought during the Great Patriotic War, became by that time admirals and generals, professors, doctors of naval science. I met at the academy as the head of the department twice hero of the Soviet Union, General of Aviation V.I. Breakoff who during the war carried out bombing strikes on Nazi ships in the Baltic and the Black Sea. More than one fascist ship rested on the bottom of the sea from the precise blows of his bombs. At the head of another department was Vice Admiral B.F. Petrov, an excellent organiser and inquisitive researcher, always drawn to the development of issues of theory of naval art. With Professor Doctor of Naval Sciences E.P. Shurov, we once laid the first thread of the ice road of life on Ladoga. L.P. Vertanikov, V.I. Soloviev, V.S. Lisutin, K.V. Penzin, G.D.D. Darchenko energetically developed new theoretical issues. It is impossible to even name all the growing, talented researchers, no matter how much one would like to. There are a lot of them. They still work at the Academy to this day to them, belongs the honour of continuing to develop the theory of the Soviet naval art on the basis of the achievements of our military science and technology. The chief naval staff of the USSR Navy, under the leadership of Admiral F.V. Zazuli correctly understood then the role and capabilities of the academy. On the instructions of the Navy Commander-in-Chief, Admiral of the Soviet Union Fleet S.G. Gorshkov, the educational process and scientific work, were brought closer to the solution of the problems faced by sailors. The commander-in-chief often visited us, delved into our work in detail. As a result, the academy became the centre of naval thought, a kind of laboratory for research of the most complex operational, tactical and technical problems. 
Now it is unthinkable to separate the issues of military technology from the art of war. Life demanded from line officers deep technical knowledge and from engineers knowledge of tactics and operational art. It is not surprising that in 1960, instead of two naval academies was organised one, which began to train both officers operators and naval engineers of all specialties. We could not have successfully solved the large, complex task of restructuring the educational process and research work without the active assistance of the large and active party organisation of the academy. It was constantly engaged in the education of young scientific cadres. It was the force that cemented and inspired the collective. The work of our party organisation was given constant attention by the main political department of the Soviet Army and Navy. Admiral V.M. Grishanov, a member of the Military Council of the Navy, often visited the academy, checked the work of the political department, advised on how to better organise the work. For a long time the party organisation of the academy was headed by experienced political workers Lieutenant General N.V. Malyshev and Rear Admiral I.I. Mordvinov. A great role in the education of students and scientists belonged to the Department of Marxism-Leninism, which was headed by Professor Colonel L.S. Pavlov. He was able to spread the influence of his department on the whole style of educational process and research work in the academy. Every year I had to take part in large fleet exercises with a group of officers of the academy in special training camps of senior personnel held under the leadership of the Navy commander or even the Minister of Defence. The connection between the academy's scientists and the fleet was becoming the closest and it soon became absolutely necessary for both the academy and the fleet. Favour, more and more officers and admirals directly from ships and formations joined the academy. They carried with them the practice of life, without which theory cannot develop. Every year laboratories were expanded, they were equipped with new equipment. The old equipment, which had served more than one generation of naval officers for tens of years, was dismantled, and it was replaced by the latest equipment. Marshals of the Soviet Union GK, Zhukov, R.Y., Malinovsky, A.I., Grechko visited the academy. Admirals and generals of friendly states were our guests. They were always delighted not only by the magnificent premises, but especially by the laboratories and classrooms equipped with the latest technology. The most prominent scientists of the country took part in the research work of the academy. The academy was growing, its authority in the scientific world was growing. Of course, I could not manage all the activities of the academic staff without the help of my experienced deputies in the first years they were Rear Admiral G.V., Steinberg, Vice Admiral A.N., Petrov, and later Major General V.P., Beimart, Vice Admirals L.A., Kurnikov, V.F., Kotov and Rear Admiral M.P., Stepanov. I owe them a lot. Having set this or that task, I tried not to interfere with my comrades' excessive tutelage, giving a wide freedom of action. It seemed to me it was better to let a man make a mistake than twenty times I will distract him with my questions and instructions. Trust, in turn, gave birth to initiative and increased the sense of responsibility, the effort to do better. We lived amicably, the work was going well. But time inexorably flew forward, and in 1968, having served in the Navy for half a century, I lowered my flag of active service and left the walls of the academy I loved. But I did not leave the sea. It will stay with me till the last day.